Okay, changing the university. You saw in the movie there was the professor who dropped dead. Uh, I think that that was a reference to Paul Samuelson. He was he was asked, you know, uh, how do you make progress in economics? He says economics makes progress one death at a time. And I mean that's basically the answer. You have to wait for these guys to die. <laughs> was the answer they were giving you in the film. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, for the reasons that were explained in the film. Once you've spent 25 years of your life working with some stupid little model, that is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Uh, and you're not going to suddenly abandon it. Ab changing your mind in, a, in economics is very, very rare. Once in a while you do come across someone who, who has, but it doesn't happen very often. Now, I'm actually still reasonably optimistic about the United States educational system. I can admit, when the crisis hit, Jamie Galbraith and I were on a panel at the AEA, and, and we said, oh, good, you know, it's over. It's all over. No one is ever going to teach you, you efficient... You have to explain your acronyms, because we are not oh, US. American Economic Association an annual meetings. Okay, so it's the big 20,000 economists meet. And we were on a panel, you know, uh, economic, uh, the teaching of economics in the aftermath of the crisis. And so we were extremely optimistic. We said, it's all over, you know. The, there's nobody who could teach efficient Marcus hypothesis, rational expectations, real business cycle theory with a straight face in front of students anymore. It's gone. No one's going to teach that stuff anymore. Well, it turned out we were wrong, of course. Uh, they're still teaching it. Um, but I'm still reasonably optimistic about the United States. And the reason is because we have 5,000 colleges in the United States. And most of these colleges actually want their professors to teach something that interests the students and that actually benefits the students. And the students want to know what happened in the crisis. What's going on right now? Okay. Are we recovering or not? Why is inequality still so high? and still rising in the United States. Why has more than 100% of all the recovery gone to the top 1% of the population and nothing has gone to the bottom 99%? In the United States, they want the professor to teach that. Now, not at Harvard, not at MIT, you're not supposed to teach that to your students. So what the students at uh, those places have done, they started walking out of the classes. There actually was a, a, a boycott, a protest, of Gregory Mankiw's introductory, introductory um, class at Harvard. The guy who wrote the textbook that everybody in the world uses. The students boycotted and uh, picketed outside his classroom because they don't want to study that. The, a similar thing happened in the 60s and there actually was an opening. The universities started hiring a whole bunch of Marxists uh, at these places because the students demanded it. In the United States, because we have so many colleges, we have uh, no what's called research exercises around the world. We have no government that tells us what we must teach. And so each college is more or less free to teach what they want to teach. And the students have some ability to pressure the university to teach stuff that is relevant. So we're doing actually a pretty good job. At University of Missouri, Kansas City, our program is 100% heterodox. All of our students are heterodox, and every one of our students gets a, a tenure track position teaching economics. They're spreading all over the United States, they're teaching the stuff that's correct, um, and they are pretty much free to teach what they want to teach in the classroom. Um, now, there still is a big problem because uh, most of these schools that my students go to don't have any PhD programs. PhD education is still dominated by very mainstream departments. There are only a handful of departments that teach heterodox economics at the PhD level. So the training of economists to who will be the next generation is uh, very poor. And that is a big problem. And it's even a problem that's recognized that some of the places that are very orthodox, things have gotten so bad that they don't even have anyone who could actually teach macroeconomics because the mainstream hasn't turned out any macroeconomists for 25 or 30 years. They only teach micro. 
um, even in the macro courses. So I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic there. Okay, second, there was a question about the, the influence on policy making. I think that actually it's, it's fairly um, uh, satisfying uh, that policy makers really don't listen to economists. They really don't. They, what they do is they try to find an economist who, who will uh, support them in what they already want to do, okay? And if we do crash again, which I think we will, um, and the crash this time could be much harder to get out of than it was last time for reasons, if you want to know, I can explain why in the U.S. it would be very hard to do the same thing we did last time. So it may be harder to get out. And the policymakers might be more open to more fundamental change than we got the last time around. And uh, that will be what pushes us to better policy. It's not really going to be that the economics discipline is woken up and has started doing things that are relevant to real world policymaking. So I think most of the time, policymakers don't really listen that much to economists, they just use them to justify what they already uh, want to do.